people talk about real estate and location, 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 I think that the missing part of that equation is story. Why are people buying? If there's no why, there's no reason. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ron Sally. Welcome back to another episode of More Than A Sale. And right now sitting beside me, one such individual, he is one of the most well-known individuals in the pre-construction industry or real estate industry. If normally, how are you, man? I'm good. Thank you for joining us today. No worries. I'm a creative helping developers get to launch, renderings and animations. I'm 22, I've quit school, I just quit my job. You know, when I started, I was still a club DJ back then, I was a little, the life of the party, you know, we drink tequila till like two in the morning. Now it's more of a structured business, <laughs> and you know, like, I've stopped drinking for the most part. And I gotta tell you, I mean, I think 90% of life is luck. I was very lucky to have picked up a certain skill set and I established myself. What is an advice to younger creatives that you would share from your experience? You gotta focus on storytelling. Okay, fine, you want a story? What makes great leaders is the ability to get through difficult situations until you are pushed to the limits, until you're tested in the fire. Create that story. You've seen him before, you've heard his name, developers reach out to him. He is one of the most well-known individuals in the pre-construction industry or real estate industry, if I may say. I like to introduce Norm Lee of Norm Lee. <laughs> How are you, man? I'm good. Good, thank you for joining us today. No worries. You're a living legend, dude. First off, share with our viewers, what do you do? What does your company do? I mean, we really just focus on helping developers get to launch. So the main business is renderings and animations, branched out into films as well. Like, so like, you know, launch films, broker films, all that kind of stuff, do some event planning, but really the, the core focus is whatever it takes to get our clients to market. And uh, we call ourselves a solutions-based shop. So if our clients come to us with an issue and we have the ability and the skills to, to solve it, we do. And one of the things I like about you and, and the time that I've gotten a chance to know you and every time we hang out and we chill and we have a conversation, I realize more and more things about you and which I like to admire. And you are a creative genius. <laughs> Thank you. And you always outdo yourself per development, per launch, per project. Can you talk to me a little bit about how your process of when you take a site and it's you know a flat piece of land yeah. and you're sitting across with your client who is worth millions and millions of dollars or billions of dollars and what are their expectations? What do you ask them? Can you kind of talk, talk to me I a mean, little bit about that? I mean, for us, it's always about the story. Mm -hmm. um, I think that people talk about real estate and location, location, location. I think, you know, the, the missing part of that equation is story. Past markets that have been, have had, our greater success, you know, it's easy. Location, 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 yeah. or price point, whatever. Like real estate's hot, it's gonna fly off the shelf. And I think, but in a normal market, uh, people forget that, um, yes, location is a big part of it, but it's the story. And as artists, we are storytellers. So from an artist's perspective, when does the creative bugs get sparked? How do you, what, how do you, how do you come up with the ideas that you come up with? And do you have a moment where you kind of wake up and you, you kind of block off a chunk of time and that's your creative process of thinking, like how do, how do the ideas come to you? How do you kind of get to that stage? You know, it's, it's really about, it's not unlike what a real estate agent would do. Yeah. You know, it's really like, you have to figure out the demographic. You have to figure out why are people buying? If there's no why, there's no reason. Is it investor? Is it an end user? Is it a family trying to create generational wealth, right? These are all similar themes to yeah. what real estate agents talk about. And it's really about how you communicate that message to the people. Now, a lot of times I see on your Instagram stories, you're always dangling off of a helicopter yeah. and you're, you know, you're jumping on a flight. What, what, I'm sure a lot of people wonder what exactly are you doing on that helicopter? There's a lot of places that drones can go these yeah. days. Uh, there's a lot more places drones can't go. Yeah. Back about seven years ago, we decided to start um, a stock aerial footage yeah. uh, service. And, and so, yeah, I'm really lucky. I get to spend most of my summers in a helicopter that's got no doors, just ripping around the city and beyond. First off, what did you do before you got into this? So the story starts, um, I went to school for architecture. It was a very typical architectural internship, you know, like I always tell the story that like, you know, when I first got there, um, my first few months were spent taking out the trash and changing light bulbs. I did learn a lot in that process, but I quickly realized I didn't have the patience to go through that process, right? Like, you know, name an architect who's famous, who's like, under 70 years old. There isn't, right? Like Frank Gehry's 93 for fuck's sake. Yeah, yeah. Most famous architects are dead. The other thing about architecture is like projects take like three, four, five, six, seven, eight years. You know, like you think about like you're, we're in pre-con, right? So yeah. from the planning phase to like completion of a project can often be almost eight years. Easy. I don't have fucking patience, right? Like yeah. I'm, I have ADHD and I can't stay, stay on something for more than like two minutes. So, yeah. uh, but one of the things I learned while I was at Quadrangle was 
um, it was like a Sears, right? And they, they needed to change the sign on the building of a Sears. Yeah. And so uh, I did that in Photoshop. Uh, but it was like really hard because I was doing it all. In, it wasn't even Photoshop. It was Corel Draw at the time. So that led to me learning how to do 3D rendering. And then I got a job in a 3D rendering studio. And then that sort of went sideways. And But at that point, I had already decided to quit school. So I was four months shy of my degree. And I was like, I'm not going to pursue architecture. So I'm, I'm going to pursue... 3D rendering full time, and I, I left to join the studio, and that went to shit. So, I was sort of shit out of luck, right? Like I'm like I'm out on my ass, right? Like I'm. And how old were you at this time? Like I'm 22. I've quit school. I just quit my job. <laughs> like what the fuck am I gonna do, yeah. right? So, uh, I did the only thing I could do, which was like I tried to get a job. And then you have to remember, like this is 2001, 2002. Okay. Right, like the dot com burst has just happened. 9-11 has just happened. Like it's not a great market, but I, I didn't know what else to do with myself. Right. Like I had this skill in 3d rendering and, and I knew that it was a business. And so the one thing that was nice was that the boss that I had at the studio where I left to go work really fucked off. I was basically running the place. I was the only employee, but I was also running the place. So I learned how to, for the most part, run a business there. So when I quit and I couldn't find a job, like I kind of knew what to do in terms of running a rendering business. And yeah, like, I mean, I started the rendering business in late 2001, 2000, early 2002. Was it called normally from, from day yeah, one? Yeah, like, I mean, probably biggest mistake I ever made, like, but <laughs> at the same time, like, I mean, it made me recognizable. Yeah. Um, you know, like a lot of people always ask entrepreneurs, you know, what would you contribute your success to? Luck? or yeah. planning or skill, you know, luck or, luck or skill. And I got to tell you, I mean, I think 90% of life is luck. Being in the right place, right time. Yes, you have to apply yourself, but I was lucky. I was very lucky to have picked up a certain skill set at a certain time that it wasn't widely available and I established myself. So when you were going through the motions of setting up your company, how many people did you have? Was it, was just you, it was just you. It was you me. It was me and my mom's yeah, yeah. basement for like five years okay, mom's and then it was like no well, it was actually like two years because my mom kicked me out um because <laughs> she's like you're, you're way too old to be living in my basement yeah so for like first five years of the business we're in a basement first of my mom's basement then my own basement yeah and then we started building from there what was the pre-construction scene at that time so the pre-construction scene was not great this is early 2000s we're talking about yes yeah, early 2000s yeah. right so like this is right after dot com yeah there was a little bit of mania still like i mean this is when like city place was kicking off this was when like one Blur East was kicking off. The market was coming back, but there wasn't the volume that you see today. So there's like one or two key projects. And that's, I think that's why there was the sort of uh, mania because like it's similar to now, like it, there was an undersupply. We worked on One Bedford, which was like Lantera's first project, Toy Factory. We were there for that. Emerald Towers, which was Bazis's first project wow. in Toronto. So yeah, we were around for all that stuff. Were you one of the only companies at that point in time that did renderings or were there, there a few other like, companies too? It's funny, there was like, two or three companies. So by the time pre-con started kicking off, like, you know, like there, there was this company Daylux, which was really big in the scene. And there's this, Ch this Chinese guy, Roberto, who he basically ran the city at that point. Then there was Design Store, but they're all kind of gone now. So they don't exist anymore. Design Store, I think, still exists, but like Roberto's gone for sure. What point did you start seeing the changes happening in the industry? So first to start off with renderings where you said yeah, you were so ahead I of think your time. For, yeah. So we're about 20 years old now. Yeah. And I'd say for the first 10, 12, maybe even 15 years, we weren't actually that active in pre-con. Like we haven't known that each yeah. other that long. It's really been yeah. since been COVID. Ground I was still in middle school at the time. Yeah, yeah. You, you would have been in elementary school probably. <laughs> yeah, elementary school too. Um, so we focused mainly on, um, we liked commercial projects. So like nice big shiny office towers. Yeah, We've done Madison Square Garden. We've done Jets Giant Stadium in New York. We've done massive projects in the Middle East. Like that was sort of our bread wow. and butter. Royal Ontario Museum, Royal Conservatory Music, Art Gallery Ontario, like all these things. Like Insane. we worked on this kind of stuff, uh, Toronto Eaton Center, right? Like that was our sort of go-to, like the, I mean, it's still not done, but we did all the renderings for the Eglinton Crosstown. That was, and that was our preference, um, but world's just changed, right? And so pre-con has really changed to the point where now, no matter where you are in the world, it's the dominant form of construction in real estate. Yeah, like go to any city in the world. If there's a crane in the sky, it's likely for a condo. And so in the last five years or so, it's really kicked off. Like it's totally dominated all forms of development. It's the only form of development really. Like think about like 
you know, universities are canceling projects because they can't afford to fund them. Yeah. Eglinton Crosstown is still under fucking construction. They yeah, still man, need fucking never, like, be complete. It's like annoying. Know. Office towers, like, you know. The CIBC? The CIBC building. Yeah. We, we won the competition for that. So wow. we worked with the architect to win that. And that's just coming to completion now. But like, you know, there's a glut of office space now. Those those spaces are thankfully being leased, but like there's, you know, longer a huge demand for office space. So really it's primarily residential space now. I've always been curious, how does the whole competition process work for architects? Like when you bid on a project, like how does that- There's bidding? no bid, like yeah. they invite you and then, you know, they give you a certain sum of money to produce a proposal. Got it. And then it's just a competition of ideas. And then when you sit down and try to come up with that idea, you, you sit with your team, what do the conversations sound like? What are the conversations- no, I mean, it's it's no different than any other project. I mean, yeah. you know, it's some architect pulling something out of his ass and thinking it's gonna look good. And, <laughs> and you know, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, right? Like, yeah. I mean- In your pursuit of growth, your pursuit of success tell me a little bit about what your mindset was then versus what your mindset is now where were you what was a normally like you know 10 15 years ago versus a normally like now yeah i mean i think like all of us we all go through evolutions yeah uh, you know i was young and brash you know when i started i was still a club dj back then i was the life of the party you know we'd go we'd close the, the studio at you know 3 p.m on a tuesday and we'd go drink tequila till like two in the morning yeah it was a lot more fun back then now it's more of a structured business <laughs> and you know like we don't go drinking tequila at two on a tuesday or you do and you don't tell anyone yeah <laughs> <laughs> i mean for the i've stopped drinking for the most part um the difference between what we were back then versus what we are now is that there's a huge shift in how organizations are run i think it's the benefit for young people starting businesses today is there are, there are many examples of creative businesses that have made it. If you would have looked at the time when I came up, creative businesses that you know came up were like you know big ad agencies or like you know big marketing firms and stuff like that. And so you didn't really have a template for how to grow like a small niche business, right? You know, like even guys like Velo and like that, right? Yeah. Like you know they at least have the benefit, like they can come see a guy like me and say like, Hey, how do you do this? That the other thing we didn't have that. Yeah. And so I think that's what made it more difficult. It was much more sort of fly by the seat of your pants, hard scrabble. Whereas now there's blogs, there's books, there's podcasts that you can like call on for resources back then. It was tough, man. Yeah. There's more information available. Yeah. And like the person yeah. I am now is like, I'm far more structured and disciplined because I understand that that's what it takes to run a business. Whereas back then you're just like, yo bro, I'm just like, living life, right? Like, and I'm just trying to make it. And, and there's no, there's no role models. There's no mentors. There's no template. Because of all, there's so many notable projects that you've done. And again, there's a whole week, this, we can take a whole podcast sure. talking about all the notable projects that you've done. Has there been one project that you were working on or that comes to mind where you're like, man, everything that could go wrong <laughs> went wrong? Oh, but it, it wasn't even like one project. I mean, <laughs> you know, I think at the height of it, which was like 2017, 2018, this is why I talk about this is what I mean when I talk about like not having a template. Like, so we had um, meteoric success in 2016, 2017. So we doubled the business. We moved to new offices. We doubled the size of the team. But, you know, I'm a creative first, business person second. And I hadn't learned a lot of the lessons about how to manage cash and like manage overhead and all this kind of stuff. And we didn't have very strong processes in place for like AR management and just getting money through the door. And although... From the outside, like if people saw us in 2016, you know, we rebranded, our team doubled in size, literally went from 22 people to 45 people in the span of like six months. That's when things really popped off. Things were popping. Yeah. Were like on the surface, if you're like from the outside looking in, yeah, things were popping. Within three weeks of moving into our new office, we had to lay off 30% of the staff. Not for any other reason than we didn't manage our contracts well and we didn't manage our cash well. And so we were doing a lot of business in Vancouver at the time. Like we ran Vancouver. Like we, we sent, we sent like two brochures out to Vancouver and then like everyone fell in love with us so. and came knocking on our door and we're like, yo, amazing, amazing. Right. But we didn't understand the Vancouver market and how, the, so like here, if you get SPA, you know, site plan approval, you're pretty much a go, right? Like you're you, like the project's approved by the city. If the developer chooses to go for it, it's a go. Vancouver Yo, you get SPA. And then there's still four readings after this. They call them readings. You still have to go through four steps of approval before your project can actually launch. And so like, they don't know until the day you're supposed to like start working, whether or not this project can actually go forward. And so we had this one summer where like seven or eight of these projects and they're all worth like big chunks of money. Like at the time, these jobs were worth like 150 grand, which to us was big money at the time. And they all get canceled. Shit. And so like, you can't rebook these projects yeah. on the turn of a dime, right? So, yeah. 
you end up with basically four or five months of like no work. Yeah. And like, you've just doubled the size of your company. You've just 10 X your rent. You've just like on and on. You've just added all these expenses yeah, yeah. based on those contracts, based on those contracts yeah. and the cash is not coming in. So we nearly went bankrupt three times over the course of two years. Wow. We actually ended up doing two rounds of layoffs. But, you know, on the outside, you know. Everything's perfect. Everything's, everything's perfect. Yeah. And the other part of that we learned too was that we just weren't charging enough. You know, that was a big lesson in like, you know, at the time we thought we were making money because we didn't have the expenses of like a full-fledged business. You know, we were young and scrappy. You know, we had 22 people working out of 2,200 square feet. Like, think about that. 22 people working out of 2,200 square feet. And this Student is, housing. And this included <laughs> a kitchen, a lunchroom, yeah. and a boardroom, and a server room. Yeah. We didn't have the, the infrastructure that was required of a mature business. And so I, I talk about this a lot in other talks that I give. It's like, you know, like when you grow a business, like it sucks because like, you know, like when you're starting a business, like you don't have a lot of cash, but you need to build the infrastructure as though you are a big business from the beginning. How did you handle it? Like when, when, when someone tells you like, Norm, we don't have money to pay for payroll next month or norm. Like, yeah, it, like it was tough. Man. So, so what did tough. you, what was the first thing that's going through your brain? Was the first thing that's going through your mind? Like, like <laughs> one of the main reasons why I don't drink is because I, I was doing a lot of drinking back then. And I'm going to be honest, like it wasn't a good time. I was part of a peer group. It's called tech, uh, the executive committee. So I had a bunch of other CEOs that I met with on a regular basis that helped me through it. I had a coach that helped me through it, but it was still really tough, man. Like it wasn't easy. I still had a fair bit of ego at that point. It was really hard to to wrap my head around. I went through some pretty ugly shit back then. I think it was also a great learning experience because I think it's one of those things where, you know, it's not something you can learn from a book. It's not something you can learn from a blog or anything like that. Like this is the kind of stuff where like, until you are pushed to the limits, until you're tested in the fire. And I don't consider myself like a, great leader or anything like that. But like what makes great leaders is the ability to get through difficult situations. And there's nothing like real life training, real life experience to get you through that. Right. Yeah. It's like, it's like, you know, a soldier can go through all the training at, at training camp, but until they're in the battlefield and bullets are flying by their head, only then do you find out if you're cut out for this. Like uh, Mike Tyson says, right? Everyone has a plan to get punched in the face. Right, exactly. Yeah. And and I got punched in the face a lot <laughs> over the course of two years. Yeah. You know, and I'm grateful to be able to come out on the other side. I'm grateful to have made it through. I'm grateful for all the support from uh, especially my team and the people around me, my family, everyone that helped me get through it because it, it's not like I got through it on my own, but it's, it's it's how you navigate that situation. I have staff, you have staff. I run a p big payroll, you run a big payroll. They see you on social media, they see the things that you do and then and where you're going and how you're doing it. And I asked myself, I said, what does my staff think of me? We, we have opinions about this. I mean, <laughs> you know, I think that we have to remember that, especially as leaders, yeah. we're here to motivate and inspire people. And I think that our success is something for us to celebrate, but we have to be very mindful yeah. of how we celebrate it. And, and we also have to be mindful of the world that we live in, right? Like, I mean, we live in a world where it's more sort of fractured than ever. And I think to be a good leader these days, you really have to be in touch or not at all. Meaning that like you have people that are in place that run the shop that are connected with your team. And I will say like, I'm less and less connected to my team these days, not in a bad way, just because I'm moving on to yeah. higher level strategic stuff. I'm not up here on my teams down here in terms of like- Have how you how, think of yourself how, or yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, you gotta, these are the people that brought you here. These are the people that are gonna get you to your next step. 100%. You gotta take care of them. You gotta treat them well. You gotta, yeah. you gotta be in touch with them. I always believe this and I even, even believe this till day. You're only good as your team and your team is a direct reflection of you yeah. simultaneously. So, and I learned that by watching Center Court run and Jason, how he operates his team and watching other, other people of how they run their sales team and yeah. what they, how they also operate. And you can always see a successful project and launch just from the way the sales team is sort of delegated and they know who's and what they're supposed to do. For me, it's really about empowering my team and giving them opportunities for success and giving them a path forward. And we're still working on that. We're not perfect at it. I mean, you're big on the whole, you know, growth mindset thing. I think that, you know, whether people acknowledge it or not, I think personal growth is definitely equal to uh, any other form of compensation and providing our team that is very important. 
and you're around a lot of high achievers. I mean, your yeah. clients are yeah. billionaires and multi, multi-millionaires that are doing incredible work and own some really successful and large companies and corporations. So when you sit down with them and you are around their presence and you're yeah. around this, this, this high achievement level, whether it's their children, whether it's their relatives, whether it's family, every company's run differently. Yeah. What are some of the things that you've picked up or remember or some of the traits that you see very regularly <laughs> from being around yeah. these individuals? I, I think there's, again, you know, the question comes down to, you know, was it skill or was it luck? Mm. Without downplaying the success that a lot of my clients have achieved, there was definitely skill in the first generation getting the companies there. I'd say for the second generation, it's definitely luck. You're born into a situation. And it's not their fault. It's not their fault. It's not their fault. It's not their fault. And that's, I'm not. I would even argue the pressure is even higher or greater. Right. You know, you're, you're a great example, right? You're born into it. Okay. So then it comes down to how do you take what you've been given yeah. and elevate even more? That's what I'm seeing now is like, it's the evolution from a family run business to a professional business. And I think that's why you see companies like Center Court do so well because the thing I'll say that's great though is I do see with the second generation that a lot of people in the second ge generation, especially if they're coming into the businesses, are taking, like they actually take the time to like go to business school or like they'll, like they'll grow up in the business and they do sort of make more objective decisions. And I think, yeah. and the reason why I say all this is because it just makes my life easier. <laughs> like if, if, if my clients are making objective decisions yeah. that are like, based on market fundamentals and all this, it just makes my life easier. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like I don't have to go chasing my fucking tail over bullshit. You ever find yourself in a situation where you're you're talking to the first generation and the second generation, they're both in the same room and the second generation is like, you know, more in line with the culture of today and the first generation is like- Oh, for sure. Yeah. And, and like, you know, I just spent like an hour this morning <laughs> trying to convince a client not to launch a fucking project. <laughs> you know, but they're like, but we've been told we have to go. I'm like, who's telling you this? Because you're just going to shit the bed. Yeah. Even they know they're to shit the bed yeah but they're like we don't have a choice what's a funny incident that you remember whether it be a project launch or a meeting or anything where you're like man this was hilarious i can't believe this just happened like did anybody catch this like uh the, there's too many like what's on, one that comes no, to mind no, listen I, i'm on the inside of a lot of stuff and yeah my, without taking names no bro people know people know <laughs> My mind is a vault of NDAs. Yeah. You know, yeah, like, yeah. no, but it's funny. Like you guys get to see the end product. Yeah. You don't get to see how it gets there. Yeah. More interesting than the funny, hilarious moments. Yeah. Is when you don't see the chaos that leads up to these things. Yeah. Like literally 45 seconds before the show. Okay, fine. You want a story? Pandemic, right? So we change the game. Yeah. We start doing these live streams, right? Change the game. So we do this one with Austin Birch. Everyone sees it. Everyone's like, whoa, what is this? So fucking cool, right? Yeah. And Center Court calls us and is like, yo, let's do this live stream. We do the first one. President at the time is like, yo, this is like the future of real estate. You're going to be able to like launch projects like online everywhere. He gets super excited, right? So he's like, we're going to do this again. I'm like, okay, we're going to do it next week. Next week? Okay, well, whatever. Sure. He's like, we're going to do it at the drive-in at the docks. I was like, the fuck? But this is also me during the pandemic thinking like, oh, I've just changed the fucking game of real estate. Sure. What can I possibly do? Right? Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, I could live stream a launch in front of 400 people to 3000 people online off my cellular connection <laughs> right so like this is like the third live stream i've ever done yeah yeah to get to the venue set it all up and like you know i show up eight hours in advance like everything's set up bro four hours before showtime the so this was the first time that driving had been used yeah the power to the entire place goes out yeah fries all my equipment shit i can't get my equipment turned back on this is 199 church yeah. right yeah 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 so like the client shows up and they're just like what the fuck's going on bro i'm like i don't know man the power went out i can't get my shit working nothing's working and they're like breathing down my neck there's like line 300 cars like waiting to get into place and they're holding the line because we can't get anything going this didn't happen but like the sales team was supposed to fly in on a helicopter and land on the site and it's just like circling and everyone's like norm the fuck is happening what the fuck is happening like i don't know the power went out i can't turn on my computers i can't turn on my routers i can't turn on my switchers i can't turn on anything right yeah now. yeah yeah oh man and so like so they like we gotta start letting people in so they let people in bro up until five minutes before that show started no one knew if it was gonna happen but on the outside there was three thousand viewers and oh that was the other part i didn't know how to set up a live stream properly at that point so I had used the link for the live stream as a test link. So that like link went dead. So like 20 minutes before the show, they had to send out a new email to all the fucking people watching oh. to send out a new link. 
bro, the screen behind me wasn't working until like 10 minutes before the show. Like, yo, like it's chaos. But all people know was there was 3000 people online. There was 400, 400 cars in the place. And it was like the most incredible launch ever. I was there. Yeah. Yeah. I was yeah. there. So yeah. as a, as a participant, you're just like, wow, that was incredible. Yeah. That was, that, that was a first, like, holy crap, just a drive-in launch. Drive-in launch and it's online on stream. Right? Yeah. But behind the scenes, yo, my client wanted to murder me, <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't even my fault. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. I was like, it's not my fault. Yeah. And even the client at the end of the day was like, yeah, okay. Maybe we pushed That's where your luck came in five minutes right before. They're like we, maybe, maybe we were a little too ambitious. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. But yeah, like a lot of these things, like they are like mad scrambles to the finish. And, but you know what, that's part of the excitement, but also like, you know, as we evolve and we grow, we try to eliminate that. Right. But even to this day, you know, like when I start a live stream, my heart is just racing. Because of that one incident, <laughs> You're like it's I don't PTSD. Know. <laughs> it's PTSD. What inspires you? What do you What do you do to stay motivated? What do you do to read? What do you do to kind of keep up to date with what's happening in the industry? How are you uh, making yourself better day by day? Being better day by day is part of our mission statement. Our mission statement is always better. I do a lot of reading. The The foundational book for me is Starts With Why, uh, Simon Sinek. If you take the principles in that and use it as a base, that's, that's how I sort of try to stay current. It's like, I analyze every project I'm on. I analyze the market. I'm like, it starts with why, you know, we talked about this earlier. Like right now, I'm just like, when it comes to the market, I'm like, why? Yeah. Like, why? Like, why are we doing this right now? What's the inspiration? It's my fucking survival <laughs> straight up. <laughs> yeah. You know, is there a quote or something that sticks with you that where you remind yourself every single day? You know, what I think about a lot these days is there's a quote I saw recently, actually two or three days ago. The quote is competition happens at the bottom. Collaboration happens at the top. Ooh, I like that. And I think the one message I think that people need to hear more is that our collective success is more important than any one individual success. For us, the, the success of the industry will make us all successful, whether you're a creative agency or you're a realtor or whatever. Cheering when you hear someone else is doing poorly, talking shit about other people's projects, none of that actually benefits any of us in the long run. You can't have one or two successful projects. You have to have all the projects being successful. You can't have one or two successful realtors. Yo, know, I shout out my competitors all the time. I don't even consider them competitors at this point. Ad hoc, pure blink, design store, whoever else is in the market. Like we're an industry. We're not competitors. We're providers within the industry. Our collective success, they go down. I can't possibly keep up with the work that's going to come my way. Yeah. Yeah, sure. It'll be a temporary bump, but like, I also need the competition. You know, like I need other people like, you know, oh, shit, I lost that project. Yeah, okay, you need people dipping yeah, out your heels. Yeah. If, if you become complacent, like it all goes to shit. You know why? If you lose, if you lose a project, it's not because someone else came with something better. It's because you shit the bed the last time. Not everyone wants to be in our sort of ecosystem, but the people that do enjoy it because it works with their working style. They like the results. They like how it gets done. Typically, if you're doing really good work and your client leaves, it's because you didn't deliver on some metric. Like I like to say in the industry, you're only good as your last sale. Yeah. The Norm Lee of today had to give advice to the Norm Lee 20 years ago when he first started. What advice would that be? And what would you tell the younger Norm Lee? <laughs> Buy a lot more condos <laughs> instead of Jordans and bottle service. <laughs> you know, I was just asked this question the other day, you know, what's the greatest re regret in your life? My honest answer is I don't live with regret. Yeah. Because everything that got me here today, it's like back to the future, right? You take yeah. out any one step, you're not the person you are today. So yeah. I don't know that I would tell the normally of 20 years ago anything different because I don't think I would be the same person. Yeah. I still have a lot of work to do on myself. But that journey getting here has been hugely rewarding. I don't know that I would give that up. You know, like I appreciate the triumph that we have achieved now because we went through those shit times. Yeah. If I hadn't gone through the hardship, I don't think I would appreciate the success the same way that I do now. Me, I would probably give my uh, younger self the winning Lotto Max numbers, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, man, but see, this is the thing, right? I think about this all the time. How great would it be to win the Lotto Max? I'd be bored in three days. I don't know, man. Let's see. Trust me, bro. I'd be born in three days. Well, there's only one way to find out, right? <laughs> you said you mentioned you give advice to younger creatives. Any cre young creative that's watching, any realtor that's watching, what's one piece of advice that you would share from your experience? The one piece of advice I would have is to be, you got to focus on storytelling. Everyone's trying to be fucking Instagram famous right now. It works to a degree to create awareness. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be on social. Yeah. What I'm saying is being on social is actually work. Yeah. You actually have to put thought and creativity 
and intention into what you're posting and how it impacts your audience. And think about building your audience too. Multiple developers, multiple sales professionals said it. Like if you're selling everything. Selling nothing. You're selling nothing. Who is Norm Lee? <laughs> Like, what do you mean? Who is Norm Lee? What do you think people see you as? But what are you really like? If you were to describe who Norm Lee is, how would Norm Lee be described as? Uh, I'm a creative who in, enjoys life. I'm a dad, right? I'm a dad to my two kids, for sure. But I just like to have fun, man. I like to do different things. You know this. Like, I, 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 we started out doing renderings. Now we're doing a million different things. I just like to have fun. Who would you be like to be remembered as? That's a tough one, man. I, I Look, I just hope I make an impact on this world. I hope I do right by my kids. I hope I leave the world a better place than I left it. I like that. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. This was an incredible episode, guys. I honestly, we definitely went over time, but it was so worth it because I got a chance to hear your stories, hear your thoughts, hear your viewpoints, and you shared some incredible points and tips. I learned a lot during our session. So, dude, props to you, man. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned for our next episode. Thank you for joining us at More Than a Sale.